Hi everyone, Raghu here. Mind rolling is back with the who's becoming a grand old friend, Annie Lamott. Annie, welcome. Hi, Raghu. Thanks. Great to to hang with you again. And um, of course, we need to let everybody know about uh, the new book you know, from Annie. And um, almost everything. Mm-hmm. Notes on hope. Okay, just tell me right off the bat, how did this all come to you? I think you had another title, but they convinced you not to use it or something? Yes, the original title was Doomed, a book on hope. <laughs> that might have <laughs> been I, yeah, a little bit I of a negative think, thing. <laughs> I don't think the sales team thought it was a big seller. No, eh? Doomed. <laughs> yeah, a book on hope. But yeah. anyway, so now it's um, almost everything. It's really almost everything I know about everything. But the, what brought you to putting this oh. particular book together at this particular very, shall we say, sensitive moment in time? Um, well, I started it la- early last um, spring of... Oh, here come the dogs now. Yeah, that's good. We're going to mix them all together. I've got a whole pile of them myself. <laughs> um, everybody I saw a year ago, a year and a half ago, was in an altered state of terror and anxiety and also inertia and everything um, that is so hard to bear. And then, um, you know, I'd actually started the last book, which was on mercy, right after the election. And because I discovered that if I said the word mercy or reference a merciful heart, or uh, it was called hallelujah anyway, which means, you know, the country is in the dire, dire shape and Raghu has a terrible head cold and, <laughs> you know, and the, and the dogs are out of control and, and my feet hurt, I have tendonitis, but you know what, hallelujah anyway. Yeah. We have life, we have breath, we have, Mm. all we have all in all um, within us and with inside around us and above us and below us and beside us and sitting right now in our lap so I wrote a mercy book and and then I started to realize and the, the theme was very Ram Dass it was that if you want to get really crazily happy if you want to have really loving feelings do really loving things right mm. now mm. and um, but then a year passed and I felt that as an, a missionary act of love, I wanted to be a hope carrier. I wanted to remind people we've been in this bad of shape before when um, Bush Cheney was president and we went to war on Iraq and we, um, you know, we set back everything pre- important to me politically, such as women's right and rights and the environment and how we take care of the poor and the elderly. Everything. And I wanted to remind people we've been here before. We stuck together. We moved to our precious communities. We brought thirsty people water. We did our prayer. We did our meditation. We found quietness and we sang and danced our butts off and we came through. So I wanted to remind people. And, you know, I think I wanted to write a book where I had the excuse to use that great John Lennon line that everything's okay in the end. And if it doesn't seem like it's okay, it's not the end. So <laughs> yeah, right. hang in there. There. Yeah, you know one thing. Yeah, th- it's we are certainly in extraordinarily difficult times, and one thing from the book that got me because I I see the uh, the ugly manifestation of anger turning to hate. Yeah. And, and you say yeah. here, how do we become so filled with hate? It's not who we are. Hate's the worst emotion of all, second only to acute jealousy, right? Yeah. Um, and, and certain people of late, and they certainly have caused the majority of us to experience derangement. And I, that is a good word because that's what it yeah. feels like. That's what it feels like. Well, the title of the chapter is called Don't Let Them Get You to Hate Them, because which is uh, something based on something Dr. Martin Luther King said. Mm -hmm. But once you're hating people, you're lost. You know, you're in an altered state that is just so negative and rashy and crunchy and miserable. And this is going to sound paranoid, which I think it is. Um, It's what they want. 
You know, it's what the far right wants is us is for us to be out of our center, which is love and truth and breath. And once we're there, we are really not very useful to ourselves or to the poor anymore. And and so I started to think about um, something I heard when I first got sober 32 years ago, which was if you got a problem, go look in the mirror. And I started to um, do the work of intimacy, you know, that kind of corny whatever it's called, where where intimacy means into me, I see. And I started Mm. to make contact Mm. with my own inner (laughs) Donald Trump (laughs) and my person who's kind of a blowhard, a know-it-all, thinks she's right, um, and also has the most terrible periodic self-esteem. I mean, Donald Trump is a man who has never once been loved in his life, Mm. and he manifests that. And um, and so I started to find the parts of me that are not loved or that I disassociated from because they were jealous or judgmental or uh, petty. Um, and um, and I started to welcome those parts of me to the table and offer them soup and say, everybody can come eat with us today. All are welcome. God doesn't say, love your brothers and sisters if they're not annoying you that day. You know, you have to love everyone. And the worst part is loving those parts of ourselves that are just so, what's the word, disappointing, let's say, you know. And (laughs) Mm. so that chapter, I think, is the most important chapter in the book um, Mm -hmm. is not on don't let them get you to hate them. And that if you do the healing, it's an inside job. And if you um, commit to that work, then what you have to offer is clear water and love. And when you're offering love, then you get in a really happy mood. Mm. I love what you say here, though. Even my Buddhist friends have been feeling despair. That's like, I went, oh, God, now we're really in trouble, right? Well, yeah. Then I said, <laughs> when we when they go bad, we know, we know it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, especially uh, poignant for us. We just did a, finished a retreat with Ram Dass and our Buddhist friends. And um, I didn't, by the way, notice. And this, of course, this overriding thing that we are living with on a day-to-day basis is present everywhere, even in the midst of this retreat where it's called Open Your Heart in Paradise, which is, is, is what we... Uh, what we aim to please you know, you get your money back if that don't happen but at the same time it's it, there is this underlying um anxiety of course going on yeah there's terror that that we um have had indications of how out of control and um uh really insane um the president is and we worry because we want our grandchildren to live in breathable air and you know the when the climate change report came out a few weeks ago and it said that within 15 to 20 years we will be in catastrophic climate conditions you saw this little child run in who i'm responsible for and i can't promise him much of anything except that I think we have been really galvanized and I think that we are back in the saddle now. And, um, but it's harsh, it's scary, it's sad. And um, what people are going through and what people in the world have really always gone through, the just grinding poverty and cruelty of those in power. So, but we don't get anywhere by hating or blaming or casting them aside. They, God doesn't cast them aside. My understanding as a Christian is that Dick Cheney will be welcome in heaven, you know, and that maybe he and God will have a tiny talk first in the ante room about the bit, maybe a bit of mess that needs to be cleaned up, but that all are welcome, all are welcome at the table. And that Dick Cheney is loved the same way my little grandchild is loved. And and so we get to to the work of, um, of helping other people who scare us to death, maybe do a little bit or be healed by the lack of attack on them, when we take the focus off of them being our problem. I mean, my default reaction to this terror and anxiety is like figure out who to blame, you know? And then usually if it's inside my family or if it's in my community, I try to figure out how to get them to change their behavior so I can be less anxious. And it's a fool's, you know, there's, there's, there's no winning when you're playing that game. Yeah. The only way we change is to be available for the healing of the being inside of us who is the being outside of us. And so we 
We do loving things and then we have loving feelings. Mm. You say, I've been one of the walking wounded for a year or so. You and, well, certainly half a country at least. Yeah. Uh, Actually more like the zombies in the night of the living dead because we are fused with people when we hate them. And that, uh, again, as well, you said it was the most important chapter. I had no idea. All I know is I gravitated because this deep, deep stuff that that you're bringing yeah. out on on the page is yeah. many of us are living through that. And and it's uh, we are fused with people when we hate them. I mean that, mm-hmm. and we're not us anymore. We become like them, whatever them is. That them. Uh, are really not doing anything to to us. So to some extent, I'm doing it to my to myself, and I think to a great extent, we are doing it to ourselves, actually. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Yeah, we're the host, the carrier, the new victim. Uh, I can't change them, so I pray, bless them with nice retirement opportunities, and change me. But while you're at it, help them not blow up the planet, which is a, a good idea as well. But but moving this back in on on ourselves. Uh, and because I really do believe that uh, f- to a great extent we are uh, absolutely um, uh, generating this polarization inside ourselves so that we have no chance at all of not thinking of a quote unquote them. So, what, yeah, what do you think? How do yeah, we. Yeah, and when we're doing that, we're adding more toxins to the common well. We're poisoning our own well. I mean, it's kind of crazy. But there's also a chapter in the book on paradox, that all truth is paradox, and that a couple things can be true at the same time, which is that we we are um, culpable, that we do add poison and blame and rejection and hate to the, to the water, to the pond, the drinking pond. And at the same time, it's appropriate to rise up. <laughs> It's always been appropriate to register voters and to figure out who you can help get to the polls on election day. But but a couple of things are true at once, which is that something has gotten into the world with Trump that is terrifying. And it has um, it has bred um, a very strong army of people who really would destroy the earth because of because of ignorance and because of not having been loved. And. Um, and that's true even as we look at them, them, and we understand their love just as much as the newborn baby at my church Sunday is cherished and perfect. And I think Donald Trump is cherished and perfect, and it's appropriate to rise up against him. Yeah. Yeah, Ram Das talks. I did a podcast with him, and he talked about, I said, you've got, you've got that picture of him on your puja. You're, you're brave. I can't. Think every time the TV comes on with that picture, I want to, you know, I do turn it off. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Yeah, I've just this is not him. These these are his karmas that are playing out." And he said something like that he'd like to go and have a chat with him and uh, have a chat with the the karmas, and maybe we can help out the. (laughs) <laughs> to transform them, perhaps. Yeah, I said, well, I think, that's right. I think you need to fly there. Uh, we'll get a, a private jet and get you flown there, like right away now, Ram Dass. Mm-hmm. He laughed, but... Uh, I think that's right. And you know, um, Krishna Das at the last spring retreat that I was at with you mm. um, said something that has so stayed with me, which was one of the younger people. You know, I, a lot of the younger people that were with us last spring really were grief struck by what's happened to the country and by their colleagues being shot at and then the, the police being acquitted and, and by the just terrible, terrible, terrible setbacks to the um, environment and to women's rights and to, you know, and the refugees and the children in cages at the border. And Christian Doss pretty much said, you know, I don't know what to make of it all. I just know to keep going from place to place singing the name of God. Mm-hmm. And that's really all I know to do, and it's enough. And, and then the, the critical mind inside of you says, how can that be enough? How can that be, you know, they're going to go tear apart the Alaska re- uh, reserves now. How can it be enough? It is. It always has been. It always will be. Uh, Einstein said that the fourth, for, fourth World War will be 
fought with sticks and and rocks, but you know there will be precious community. There will be um, groups of us doing our prayers and our chanting and our meditation, taking care of one another and doing service and and doing sacrificial love for the for the most vulnerable. And that's how it's always been. Yeah. And that's how and that's it will always work in the sense that it will always be the choice, the reality that we turn towards, we turn towards the light. And but see, left to my own devices, I fixate on how awful people are behaving, you know, and how how this should change and this must change and this is about to change and this and this. It's like when you see tiny babies, infants really, they do this funny little self-comforting thing. And it looks, I also thought it looked like they were knitting. <laughs> They go like this, you know, this kind of worried thing, uh -huh. but it's self-soothing. And I think in certain ways, our hatred and judgment can be that same kind of obsessive self-soothing. And we don't know it. And then someone mentions it and it breaks the trance and we go, oh, right. I am love. I am surrounded by love. I was made to love. There's, you know, and then we get our, we get the truth of our spiritual identity back. And then we become really loving people full of grace again. And that, that's what changes the world. Yeah. And uh, just a little further, well, I mean, I'm very much into, um, as your whole book is just full of, quote unquote, you never say the word mindfulness. Be mindful, be aware, look at the motivations, look at the way that you're not, you know, you're straying from the, uh, as a Buddhist would call, true nature, true inside person. That would probably be. Uh, what what was would be found in the book, uh, but righteousness, which is the most difficult uh, for us to transform, when we are stuck in our convictions, convictions and personas, we enter to, into the disease of having good ideas and being right. Right, and we think we have a lock on truth with our burnished surfaces and articulation, but the bigger we pump ourselves up, the easier we are to prick with a pin. Uh, so and also it goes on to say, and also the bigger we pump ourselves up, you can no longer see your feet on the ground, yeah. you know, on, on our mother supported by and held by and, and in wonderment to our mother earth. So, but, but I, that's my first um, response to this terror or this feeling of being the victimized self-righteousness, you know, that, and, and the only solution is bless them and heal me and help me get right sized again and who here needs water maybe it's me you know mm -hmm. for me to get myself a glass of water and to do radical self love with my sometimes annoying and always self-obsessed self is an act of of global healing mm -hmm. so there's a lot about self-care and about how it, it's like ram dawson and uh, Casper Weinberger, when I first read about his poop the table, <laughs> yeah, yeah. where he'd wake up, good morning, yeah. Mary, good morning, Jesus, oh, good morning, Krishna, oh, good morning, good morning, Casper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. with with Casper or Dick Cheney or um, or Donald Trump, it's it's so tempting and oh, you know, we I think we I'm just repeating myself now, but it's just so tempting and easy to see the damage they're doing and the many many ways in which they might change. And for me. To radically change the world might be to pay attention to my breathing for three minutes. Mm, mm. For three mm. minutes. But then those critical voices again say, what will that do? What good mm -hmm. is that going to do? What is three minutes? Three minutes, we can't even give you a partial credit. It has to be 20 minutes. Better if it's two hours. Nope, sorry. And then it, we cross our arms at ourselves. And then we experience the rejection and contempt that Trump seems to have for people like me, say. Mm who are feminists and who are spiritual seekers and who are pacifists. Yeah. You know, there's a story in the book uh, of a good friend of yours named Kelly. And just reading that whole thing, I just started to feel, I mean, she, she fought with alcoholism and uh, it's, it's quite a, a you know, a long story and you, you must get the book, everybody out there, and you'll, uh, you will enjoy. Uh, but in this particular case, it's, you know, a tragic story, ultimately, but also one, it's not one thing, that's for sure. But what I found, you know, we talked about her uh, alcoholism and addiction that way, but it, ultimately, 
she was addicted to her story. She was so tied into her story, which included atheism and so on, so fixed there, so much in belief of those thoughts, that that was the the real addiction. Uh, Less so, I mean, of course, alcoholism is a a tremendous issue. But yeah, I've been working on that a lot, actually, lately, uh, in terms of talking to people about our addiction to our stories. Uh, Krishnas calls it, we wake up in the morning with the movie of me and it, you know, director, we're the producer, yeah. we're the mm-hmm. protagonist, we're the whole thing and we ain't going to let go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that thread is in, is in this book. Uh, maybe talk about a, a little bit on uh, the deep way in which we are so absolutely. Is that you beeping? Cause I don't know how to do anything. So I don't no. even think I have the ability to make the computer beep. <laughs> It's uh, it's you, but it is? it's okay. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. 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 Yeah. Um, so yeah, the movie of me, I love that. I also, I in, in alcoholic um, recovery programs, we also tend to think about the committee and about how we wake up and the committee is already sitting there on the bed and the committee's had coffee and it's already a little disappointed in how things are going. <laughs> that you're getting a little bit late start, or that you um, are a little flustered, or whatever. And but it is a movie of me. And in in our recovery, we also talk about wanting to be the stage director because we're just so sure that we're right. And we were taught that by our parents. We were taught that dad was right. And so then we became people that really needed to be. We needed to be right. We needed to make the the correct decision and then stick to it. I don't remember in the 50s anyone telling me you could change your mind. (laughs) And so um, it didn't come up, you know, until the women's movement in uh, in the 70s. And um, so you you have these convictions that you want to be happy or you want to be right. Well, I feel that I am right. But why doesn't that make me happy? Well, because the committee and I would like to stage manage everybody else that they're talking too loudly or not loudly enough, or actually they're not even supposed to be on stage yet, mm-hmm. or the lighting is off or, or whatever. And this um, ability sometimes in these teachers who help us get out of ourselves and, and become either people for others or people of the way, you know, people of the the way that's what they originally what christians called themselves were people of the way and and a christian was a pejorative term which i completely understand as a left-wing christian but anyway um it's so it's the ultimate liberation to get freedom for however long you can on any given day from this from the story of me and to instead get into wonder and instead get into that umbilical connection that breath work gives us to to the great, beautiful, good thing that isn't our, our, you know, the rat exercise wheel of our minds. And so that's really what the retreats are about, right? They're about unhooking from the neurosis. And I love that Ram Dass says, you know, I've been doing this work for 60 years and I have every neurosis I ever started with. But um, it's like, do you want to unhook for an hour here, half hour here, a day here from this mind that is filled with stuff that your parents told you about yourself that wasn't true then? It certainly isn't true in your mid-60s when you're about to start getting Medicare. Um, Or do you want to hook into the bigger thing? Do you want to hook into the wave? Do you want to hook into the... To the where to the sky? Do you want to hook into the heart? Do you want to talk to be today? I think today is a feast of Guadalupe, and she is really my favorite saint because mm. what she says, she appears in the 1500s to a terrified Indian boy in Mexico. She says, "Some don't be afraid. I'm here." And she says, "I'm your mother. Your mother's here." And most of our lives have been spent desperately trying, desperately trying to get people to put on the mother suit so that we can have a little feeling of connection and being loved. And the mother's here and the mother's inside us. And we are the mother. I'm your, I'm your mother, you know, and you're my mother. That little boy who ran in here is my mother. That's what mother love looks like. And um, but it's very hard to do when you're when you and the committee are sitting around like with your clipboard plotting strategies so that other people can understand how poorly they've behaved and how they really better start acting better. Yeah, the committee. Yeah. 
that committee probably includes a psychiatric nurse, hopefully, that can help oh, you out, as a friend so. of mine said to me. Uh, my dog is my psychiatric yeah. nurse. You know, yeah. And I've said in this book, in almost yeah. everything I've written, that our dogs are the closest we're going to come to knowing the direct love of God on this funny blue marble. Mm. Well, I've got five of them, Annie, so uh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm there. Yeah. Uh, there's a... Uh, a chapter on God that's called Ja. And when I looked at that, I went, yeah, I've forgotten. I've had such a bad time with God, G-O-D. <laughs> oh, God, I've had a bad time with God. And yeah. you say, God, it, your thing, God is the worst nickname ever. And, I right. was, and Ja, I, I did, we did a retreat oh, a, couple, a couple of months ago, or a month ago, not that long ago, that we do in Ojai, California, that Ram Dass gets Skyped into, and a bunch of teachers, and, you know, we really use his material as a jumping off point for people, and uh, the thing that I picked, he did this series, by the way, in um, the opening of Naropa Trogium Trumpa School in, wow. uh, in Boulder, and he was there for yeah. that opening, and he did, like... I don't know, a couple of weeks on the Bhagavad Gita and its revel wow. irrelevance rather to us. And one of the things he talked about was um, the state of Brahman and God, just another word. And I thought, okay, I don't have any baggage with that word. Mm -hmm. Same, I don't have any baggage with Ja. I love Marley, you know, and mm -hmm. Marley yeah, said, yeah. Ja would never... What do you say? Jaw would never leave the power to the bald heads. Yeah. Right? So. He said, lively up yourself. But um, the names for God are so profound unless somebody is saying them while shaking their finger at you and explaining how much God wishes you were an entirely different person. But I had a therapist, Robin Posen, who actually is a writer too, um, and she always called God the grandmothers. And I love that so much because there's always these old ladies with great hats in the back of our church where we have about 35 people <laughs> and they're all grandmothers and they just love you crazily. They just, they don't see anything but delight in you and, and caring for you and worrying about you when you're obviously a little bit down or, or whatever. And I love the grandmothers as the name for God. And then in the chapter on God, it talks about how my son, he was raised in the church. It was raised at this funky little church in Marin City. He, um, he had to run screaming for his life, as almost everybody does who was raised in an organized religion. And when he got sober seven and a half years ago and needed to find a, a higher power or good orderly direction or luckily a group of drunks or the gift of desperation, mm. he turned to the deteriorata, which is a great parody of the desiderata where the guys say, the writer of the poem says, um, you know, honor your God, whether he's a hairy thunderer or, or a cosmic muffin. And so my son started calling God the cosmic muffin. And that was almost eight years ago. And we still say, you know, have, has the muffin gotten back to you on this yet? Or <laughs> have you, have you spoken uh, to the muffin about this? So I have to lean out of screen for just a second to turn okay, this off. But <laughs> the I'm muffin. back. Uh, I, here's, this is why I love you, Annie, the way that you characterize. We are talking about a higher power, a power that might be called not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or a kindness, a patience, a hope which is everywhere, even in an in even in our annoying, self centered, fraudulent selves. Mm -hmm. And and throughout the the book, uh and th throughout all of your books is this sense of don't beat yourself to get to death. Uh, it's okay. We're human. Jack yeah. Cornfield does that all the time. We're human. It's okay. Look how crazy we are. We got these, uh, you know, we throw weird stuff into a mouth and we crunch it and, you yeah. know, and he says, if you ever watch yourself having sex, that's really off the wall. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You know? And yeah. I, yeah. Well, the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made, which I love so much because I think that 
what it means is how vulnerable we are, you know, and we're also, we have aggression in us. We're human. It's okay. We're a violent species and Cain is still killing Abel and we're as vulnerable as kittens and we're pure love. And it's scary to be here. It's scary to have been hurt. It's scary to have been, to have lost love. It's awful to have watched your children or your nieces or nephews have been rejected and, there's a boundless supply. It's the living water. And inside of us, there's also that one of the Psalms, and I won't remember which one it was because I'm a bad Christian, but <laughs> it, talks about, it talks about deep calling to deep, which is the waterfall down the street calling to the galaxies. And the thing inside of me that is the heart of God, that is Guadalupe, being able to say to you, Ragu, don't be afraid. I'm here. And um, it's my it's this thing inside of me that is of no size or weight or age or dim, a dimension that is um, entirely and wholly a, in both ways, the W-H-O-L-E-Y and the H-O-L-E-Y sacred and um, perfect. Yeah. And yet we're human and it's so easy for people. And I think maybe especially women to give away everything they have because we were raised to get our value from making everybody else feel whole or in, in my case to make the men feel better about their their behavior like to the mothers or to the other women and the girls would come along we were like little flight attendants you know we just helped we pumped up the men it was like a little gas station and we were 50 and 60 pounds at the time i was mixing blender drinks by seven and eight no. so uh and i learned that that was my value was how uh, the men with power and the handsome men thought i was doing and so it's very hard to stop doing that and instead to say to your own baby precious self, are you okay? What do you need? Well, I think I need a, a bag of Cheetos. I wonder if that's true. I wonder if we could just stop for a minute. I've got a minute. Do you want to talk about it? Well, I'm lonely. Okay, well, the Cheetos will be like putting ice cream on a Lego. And you're, I'm happy to go get you some Cheetos. But the one horrible thing is that it won't work. It won't fill you. It won't even taste good after the first couple of fistfuls. You know, what else might work? Well, I'm thirsty and I'm sleepy. Well, what if we had a cup of tea and then a nap? And then we checked back in. We revisited the Cheeto issue. And that kind of self-love and connection is communion. It's communion. It's remembering the truth of our spiritual identity and connecting with the, the, the deep calling to deep of the, the voice outside that hears us. Like in the Beatles song, let it be, you know, that voice mm. saying, I'm right here. Are you okay? I love you. Mm. You seem a little sleepy. Let's get in bed and read. Mm. I have found also the most important thing for any of us is that communion with each other, people of, yeah. of, of one heart. And yes. I think I tell everybody where, in fact, we have through the foundation, uh, Love, Serve, uh, Remember Foundation, we put people together around the world now. I mean, it's, a, it's becoming bigger, larger and larger because it's obvious that people want to share and they yeah. want to know that, yeah, no, we're, we're all fragile. We all have these kinds of crazy ass thoughts. We all, and we also have love and caring. And mm -hmm. once people recognize that, uh, that's I think more transforming than anything. I mean, we we do all these practices, yes, but that very fact of communion with each other uh, is uh, is super important. Uh, well, it means you're halfway home. Mm. as soon as you get there another thing like if we do the writing a writing workshop or something about creativity at, at one of um, your retreats something that has been so important besides the communion with self the beloved and and the beloved community is that a lot of us who were raised in scary or very very repressed or alcoholic families were told that what we were seeing wasn't actually happening <laughs> And that we weren't actually feeling what we were feeling. Right. And if we're having feelings about something that they said wasn't even happening, then what? We must be crazy, right? And if you're crazy, then you're not you're not in the family anymore. You're like some the nutty relative in some weird shroud wandering from room to room, you know, in a, or in a wetsuit or something. And so part of the work I've always done with my writing students is to listen to them and to say, I think that 
if you saw something, it probably happened. I think you're a reliable narrator of your story. And if people wanted you to write more warmly about them, they should have behaved better, you know? And and so now you get to tell the truth. You're here to tell the truth. You know, there's that great William Blake line I love so much that we're here to learn to endure the beams of love. And it's very hard to learn to endure the beams of love when we're cut off from that, that central belief in our own self and as observers and and as having the eyes of God behind us looking out, you know, with and there's that wonderful thing the priest who helped AA get started said, who was not himself an alcoholic, but he said, sometimes I think that heaven is just a new pair of glasses. But the new pair of glasses means somebody within you or beside you or with you who says, if you think that's happening, I think you're I think it did. If you tell me something happened when you were little, I believe you. And so, and to get that back is really the main thing that I have to offer other writers and would be writers is tell it, say it, Mm. be it, live it. You are it. It's true. I believe it's true. Tell me the story. There's a, uh, there's a chapter on writing in this book. And one of the six year olds I was teaching (laughs) said, I said, what is, what is the story? He said, it's the tell the saying part. And, um, and I love that. It's the same part. But when we were, when I was a child, you know, I was raised by atheists. When I was a child, I would have thoughts about the world or what was, ha- you know, National Geographic covers of children with flies on their eyes. And I'd be crying and my parents would say, oh, for Christ's sake, Annie, now what? Or I couldn't go to the pound because it would make me cry because, the, you know, the old cats aren't going to get picked. And it would just break my heart because I had a big open heart. And no one remembered to say, Annie, that is the most beautiful way to be. You know, like Carly Simon said, there's more room in a broken heart. And this is what all seekers seek is to have that thin candy m M&M coating around a shell broken so that we can be back in union with God and ourself, which is the same way, you know, two different ways of saying the same thing, back in union with tr- with truth. And But no one remembered to say that to me, so I was very shamed for being an emotional mm. and sensitive child. Mm. And so what I've tried to do with my own child and my own grandson and my, all my writing students is say, this is the most incredible way to be. Now, say it. But now you have to take a pencil, regrettably, and scribble it down on paper. Mm -hmm. I'll be right here next to you. Yeah, and probably have a little bit of courage that you allow to come to the surface to be able to be honest. To make mistakes, to do it badly, to write badly, to write way too long, to write Mm -hmm. overwrought passages and Mm -hmm. for it to be too purple and too many actions. You know, Joseph Heller, 40 years ago, was asked, about the edit of Catch-22, and the interviewer said, uh, he said, oh, I took out 380 pages. And the interviewer said, what was it? And he said, adjectives and adverbs. And I thought that was so brilliant. And so I say to people, Joseph Heller had to take out 380 pages, write long and write really badly. And that's how we're going to come up with something that we can then start to work with. Mm, That's beautiful. You know, it's, there's a lot, just to switch subjects a little bit, but empathy is uh, something that is, uh, word is, that is used throughout the book. And um, talk about, I mean, I have my own ideas of the difference between empathy and compassion, but tell me what you think the differences are or the similarities or how they're connected, because I think it's important uh, Definitely. Well, I think I'd, I'd much rather listen to you on it, or I, I would love to sit down and write about it. But empathy to me is more the um, response, the merciful response to those we see suffering. And it's a merciful response, whereas compassion just seems like what our reality is. Compassion is our us, compassion are us, and we just are yeah. compassion. We're, we're God's love, you know, God's love. Um, what was that organization that served people? God's love, we, you know, I, it's funny, I actually have, have it, um, the initials for it uh, inside my ring, so I'll never forget, but now I'm wow. getting old and I forget everything. God's love, we deliver. Remember from the AIDS oh, epidemic yeah. in the 70s, God's, oh, sorry, I beeped. We, um, <laughs> God's love, 
we deliver and that's who we are and that's what compassion i just am that i'm god i'm a delivery system for god's love whereas empathy is more i see and i my heart so softens you know the book on mercy is based on the original greek word which is misere which means a heart for someone else's troubles and i think that that is empathy that your heart is softened it's like a meat tenderizer on your heart where it becomes soft and pliable again and breathe and, and permeable and um and compassion i really believe is just our our reality our natural state um, I think that Donald Trump's natural state is compassion, but he is um, has never, ever, ever been loved, and he has never been allowed, even for a second, to be vulnerable, to be held, to, to make mistakes. I mean, that's mostly what I tell my writing students is waste more paper and make more mistakes. You know, that's the way home. And that I would tell spiritual seekers, too, is waste more time. Stare off into space more. When I was a child, and I'm sure when you were a child, if you stared off into space at your house or your classroom, some adult came along and said, don't you have something to do? Mm -hmm. You know, but, but now if you want to write, if you want to create or compose or sculpt or whatever, you need to stare off into space because it's deep calling to deep. We're trying to see and capture in our art something kind of ineffable that's within us and outside of us. And so, but I think that what is in us is only compassion. And then um, if we have been loved back to our senses, then we respond with empathy and with understanding that there's exactly one family here, that everyone is brothers and sisters. There's a story I don't hate <laughs> in um, the book, I forgot what it's called, almost everything, about uh, my uncle who just oh yeah, had, That's he had nothing, he had zero interest in me. He would patronize me when we were doing really, really well. He had no interest in who I am or in my heart or my troubles or losing my father in my early 20s or anything. And then I hurt. I said the most horrible, insulting thing that I couldn't even say on a podcast. And, um, and so that, of course, didn't improve our relationship. And he was cold and weird for 40 more years. And, you know, I go and I visit him sometimes twice a week. And his memory care, his memory is actually pretty good. And his face lights up, you know, like Florence Henderson has come to visit him. And he just has, and, and you know what? This stuff takes place outside of time and space. But it is that connection to, he is in pure compassion. He's not particularly in empathy. He doesn't care that our cat ran away. He, he would never bother asking because he's in the, me, the movie of me. Um, of himself, but um, he is compassion, and I he found it. He found it in his 90s when uh, he had lost enough armor by time and you know, and in, in a losing uh, body and, and mental capacities to be available to do what he was born to do in the first place. Mm. Who he came here as mm. love and wonder. And I walk in, and he's like, <sighs> It's amazing, eh? All the stuff that gets stripped away in aging is... Yeah. Uh, you say, we're consumed by the most intense love for one another and the joy of living along with the grief and terror that we and our babies will know unbelievable hurt, broken bones, bad boyfriends, old age. We live one day at a time knowing it's over too soon in what feels like about 18 years and seven months. Zip. Time for a yeah. nice catheter and heart pills. Ouch. <laughs> Every day we're in the group of the impossible conundrum, the truth that it's over in a blink and we may be near the end and that we have to live as if it's going to be okay no matter what. And yeah. someone named Niels Bohr wrote, you quote, the opposite of a true statement is a false statement, but the opposite of a profound truth can be another profound truth. Huh? Yeah. Uh, Niels Bohr was um, Einstein's colleague who oh. probably did as much work for the theory of relativity as Einstein did. But I mean, that's in the chapter on paradox. It's just all truth is a paradox that, you know, my mind doesn't work nearly as well as it once did. And yet I'm happier than I've ever been. You know, mm -hmm. I forget about how many things are annoying me today. And I forget. Oh, and 
I'm loved out of all sense of proportion. And I wasn't aware of that at 40. At 40, I was more aware of how much work there really was to do on the Annie project, you know, and how many corners needed to be rounded off or sanded, or you're just so aware of how much BS you're carrying with you. And, and then you start to throw it out of the airplane because you, friends are dying by in your forties and fifties and especially sixties. And you realize you're not going to lug around these boxes of these old briefs, you know, that you've been carrying around forever. And you start checking them out of the airplane so you can fly a little higher and then you discover that you were born to fly a little higher and you do whatever it takes to um, keep afloat not to keep alive to keep afloat a lot of the people I pray with and keep company when they're dying do end up dying but they end up in perfect healing mm, yeah it's interesting they end up afloat yeah um, and you do talk in the book somewhere about sort of an advisal start work we are going it is a limited scene here however the mystery is the mystery but maybe start working on that way earlier and you talk about working with people who are dying you 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 get very graphic around yeah you need to after someone dies that's a beloved a family member wash that body Uh, this will be a gigantic a transformational experience and uh mm-hmm. and we 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 do much of this kind of advisal for people in 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 the retreats and everything we had the, well the retreat you were at was no yeah. death no fear and uh, in fact that's, no death no fear yeah yeah, yeah and we're coming well, i wrote a, that chapter on death because one of the younger people in our family and in, in their 20s what was so afraid of us dying of the grown-ups who take care of them dying of of anyone dying that they couldn't live without and the only way through that is to move in close to it and to breathe along with it and to do beautiful loving care to the in the service of death and dying and it makes you so free when you have to stop, when you get to stop running from the abyss that your whole life you thought you were about was about to open up at your feet, and that you know you spent your whole life trying to avoid or trick out with cute throw rugs from IKEA, and it said when you stop and you see somebody who's not going to live, but who really is going to have full healing, and who that day is doing joy and wonder, and who is really really loving the expensive chocolate you brought. You know, it's meaning of lifetime. Mm. Mm. But everybody I, out there, you all listening here, uh, do think about this. This is a good thing. There's a great book by, uh, a series of books by Carlos Castanadas from long to mm-hmm. 70s. And uh, he had a brujo or a, uh, a guru, a healer. And that Don Juan and Don Juan used to tell him every day live as if death is on your left shoulder I think it was but right on your shoulder right with you be with it Mm -hmm. and you know obviously to be or yeah or Frank Austin our brother Frank Frank, yeah Austin Seski Austin Seski Austin Seski yeah this amazing book, The Five Invitations. Yeah, the Five Invitations. The yeah. Five Invitations. It's a life-changing book. People say what it's about. Well, it's about death, dying. It's about hospice. And it will ultimately lead to more happiness than you can even And freedom. You know, and play, radical playfulness and silliness and 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 meaningfulness and and they go and a lot of people are very skeptical and i say read 10 pages and then they always finish the book and then they foist it on everyone else (laughs) yeah that was great oh god that whole thing five invitations yeah Uh, by the way everybody out there just a little plug because we're talking about an annie reminding me about that retreat that she was at and it uh, that uh Next, in early uh, 2019, at the end of the month, we're uh, going to present that whole uh, retreat uh, cut into focused bits, digestible bits, as an online course. Okay, so look out for that, everybody, because it was truly uh, some amazing, amazing content. Frank and Roshi Joan Halifax and Bob Thurman and Krishnadas Ramdas and all of them. Um I just, I mean, I, you know, I start, what I do, Annie, is when I, especially if I'm going to talk to somebody about 
and they've just written a book and I'll go in and you know whatever attracts me I'll pull it aside and I've got pages of this at one point yeah. I just went no I can't keep going on here it'll take us th- like three or four podcasts before we get to all of it but uh and of course, everyone out there, you'll be able to get a link to Annie's book, almost everything, along with some of her other work, uh, on the uh, the show notes page of uh, beherenownetwork.com slash mindrolling. Uh, listen to this, everybody. Aging can be hard. It might have been useful had we not followed the skincare rules of the 60s, which were to get as much sun as possible while slathered in baby oil and basking in the in the glow of a tinfoil tanning reflector. My mother, this is her on a day-to-day <laughs> basis. Your inside person. I love yeah. that little turn of phrase. Your soul. I have to yeah. tell, we have to tell Ram Dass, hey, when you come in the spring, we've got to talk about the inside person. The mm-hmm. innermost baby in the nesting doll of you is close by, when you despair about your neck, you, you say that, and I'm reading that, and I'm going, shit, I look in the mirror, and I am despairing about my neck at times, uh, even to the point, why did you take that kind of picture of me at the retreat, okay? <laughs> your failing vision and drive, uh, but your inside person also knows that with myopia, cluelessness, and tiredness comes grace, which is, That's right? right? It, That's right. What did, what did you say at one point? Uh, uh, something about, oh, God, I don't know if I'm going to find it. But uh, in the end, Grace comes and dumps you out you know, like in, a, in a wheelbarrow at some place. Grace picks you up wherever you are. There and it, it puts is. You in its funny little rickety wheelbarrow. And it then it takes you to a, def, a different place, a slightly sweeter place. And it tips you out very gently. <laughs> Good. Very gently being apropos. Um, yeah, the inside person, um, we're, we're, we're pretty much at the end here, but, uh, actually the, the one thing, I mean, there's a lot of good advisals from you in this book, but one thing that, uh, that I think is uh, when we talk about uh, well, Ramdas talks about it. You, you, we can operate on more than one plane of consciousness at the same time. Mm-hmm. And this, is, you say, get out of yourself and become a person to others, mm-hmm. while simultaneously practicing self-care. And that I think you know those are uh, two planes of consciousness at the same time. Mm-hmm. It it also addresses when we talk about um, you know you talked about Krishna saying well I, all I know to do I, is is just chant the the name, go around singing the name yeah. of God. Yeah. yeah, and at the same time, and that's there's self care in that they're sharing so everybody can mm-hmm. fall into that heart space. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and connect with true nature and get out of your story a little bit. And at the mm-hmm. same time, any actions that you might take, because that's your karma in this, you know, whether it be uh, for the rights that are being taken away from, from us, mm-hmm. whether it be um, any kind of, of uh, action, social action, that mm-hmm. can go on at this. So this just struck me that it's, all of it can go on as long as we are practicing simultaneously the self-care. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, I think that that's a, a super important. Uh, mm-hmm. Self-care is, is um, staying in contact with yourself. It's saying to yourself, do you need anything right now? Like I would with you. If you and I were traveling through a day together, because I'm such a grandmother, I'd say, are you hungry? I, I have cashews, you know, and I have a kind bar and can I get you a glass of water? And if I'm doing that with myself, then what I'm offering you has a certain purity to it because it's it's a Mobius strip of caring instead of me um, going being a little bit empty on the inside because I'm giving you my life force and my kind bar. And so when I'm in this, this is the main way I do self-care is I touch my shoulder. It's a laying on of hands, though. 
And it's very natural for me. I'm always laying on my hands with other people and doing prayer or just quiet healing with them. And for me to do it with myself, it like breaks the first contract I signed with my parents that I wouldn't do that kind of nutty thing, Mm -hmm. you know, that we just had contempt for religious people or healers or the Christian scientists down the street. And so for me to touch my shoulder gently, to get myself a glass of water and notice it and drink it and taste the deliciousness and clarity of the water, it's why I was here. It's got to start with me, though. Mm-hmm. And the Buddhists would call aware- that uh, mindfulness and awareness of, uh, the, like the walking meditation, where you're completely mm-hmm. aware, you pick your foot up, you place mm-hmm. it forward, and it put it down. Mm-hmm. And that uh, yeah, awareness, which you bring up and talk about in the book, is extraordinarily important alongside of everything else. Uh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. A joy to be with you. Oh, Annie. you too. So, I can't wait to see you again yeah, in a few months. In a few months, yeah. Um, we're Will you take very gentle care of that cold? Yeah, the cold is gone. I got rid yeah. of the cold. There's still some lingering, God knows what. Uh, but yeah, mostly through it. And thank you, though. Thank yeah. you, thank you. So every, rest, yeah. rest is a spiritual act. Yeah, and not one, and it's another one of my story is I don't rest. I never take a nap. I have the same energy as I did when I was 25 years old, before I went to India, which I was 22. And I was the program director of a major rock and roll radio station. I'm still that guy. I'm still looking through those eyes. And I got my story, okay? And I ain't giving it up. And, you know, (laughs) so. Yeah. Well, you take gentle care, and I love you, and thank you for doing this with me. Thank you, and everybody, uh, almost everything, Annie's book, again, you'll be able to link to it and uh, um, uh, others of her books, and we will see you next time on Mind Rolling. Bye-bye. <laughs>